So um, the thing that um, uh, sex education obviously um, did, which was, uh, which was, I, I mean, let's, let's not say unexpected. I mean, obviously it's with Netflix and it's like got a global reach, blah blah. But I think one of the things that it really did um, was that it cemented the idea that there could be a global reaction to a British show. Um, and 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 there have been examples before. Obviously, Fleabag had come before that, um, and you know, going back to the Office. But I think the thing that this did was obviously that it was a, a, a homegrown, um, a, as in UK shot. Um, at, but, but Netflix developed um, production. Um, Fleabag was not, and obviously that was picked up later by by Amazon. Um, so um, yeah, I mean the the response to it was just massive, wasn't it? Um, so um, I think the way um, that you were able to kind of find your way to that show was through was it through Ben Taylor? Is that right? Yeah. So basically, something I should say is like yeah, I went back to temping and obviously happened to be working at the fire extinguisher company when I was like when I got sex ed but I was still trying anything and everything to like get my foot in the door so I did two shorts for Sky Comedy um, which were both really fun and basically I was also on a scheme called Microwave which was with like a genre script I have which is partly why we also made Smear because I was trying to obviously show them on the scheme like oh I can do horror and comedy and I'm sure as you all saw on Smear like again like it was really fun but we funded that ourselves we didn't have much money to make that um, oh, sorry, no, 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 but we also had, we had some funding, sorry, from a, a cinema group, but again, to execute what we wanted to do, it was still a small budget to do that. So, um, sorry, but my point is, uh, yeah, so with sex education, so there's a DP called Jamie Kearney, and he did one of the Sky comedy shorts with me, and he's Ben Taylor's guy. So basically, again, like Gillian, he recommended me. He just was like, you know, I just worked with this director. We got on really well. I think you should meet her for sex education. And so that's how I got the interview. And so Ben um, is quite a well-known sort of comedy director yes. who's done like a bunch of shows, including mm -hmm. Catastrophe. Um, he's also, if I'm not mistaken, um, you're both at Mind's Eye, aren't you? Um, I'm actually not with Mind's Eye, but Ben Ben is. Yes. yes. So, but yeah, um, I was so Mind's Eye is yeah. a commercial outfit. You, yes. you were represented um, by them for a while. I'm not sure yeah. if that's how you met Ben, but I think that um, my understanding was that they were looking for... Some, he was doing the first block, and they were looking yeah. for someone to do the second block, and he kind of put you forward. Did, you, did, you, did he tell you that he was going to do that? Like, how, how was that conversation? No, so basically, Jamie recommended me, and then I met Ben and another Jamie, who's the exec, um, and JJ, the producer, and basically they'd sent me the script and it was sort of similar to Five by Five. Like I just went in with a really big pitch and just, because this is the thing that I thought that Ben did that was really smart is he didn't say what the style of the show was. And so again, I just kind of went in and was like, look, the show has loads of heart. I think it's really cool. And I don't know, I think it'd be fun again to shoot the UK in a way that we don't often get to see. And I didn't feel like it should be dreary. And it was sort of a similar approach, honestly, to Five by Five, like because it had so much heart, I felt like there should be warmth in the color and how it looked. And then, I, and then again with story notes, nothing major obviously, but just like kind of stuff that I would liked in the script and then ideas that I had off that. Um, I don't know, I always go in, to be honest, with quite a lot of stuff because I figure in the interview then, if they're like, oh, actually we're not kind of, we don't really like what she's pitching. It's better to know then <laughs> than, you know, when they've hired you and, and I, I never try and really second guess also because as a director, like you're going to be on this for a long time, particularly in England, like, you know, when you're directing something like I was on sex ed for a year and I was like, I don't really want to give, even though I obviously wanted the break, but I still, I don't think it's fair to the writers or fair to myself to do something if I'm not fully passionate about it. But if you're, um, so I'm assuming that you weren't being interviewed for the first block, that was already Ben. So, so no, they, no. they weren't necessarily looking for like things like, you know, this is how yeah. I see the colour palette from mm -hmm. you. I was assuming that would already be, be set up mm -hmm. by Ben. So mm -hmm. um, is that something that you, you, you were concerned about, like kind of going in with those thoughts or you just said, fuck it and went in with it anyway? I just sort of the second <laughs> thing you said, to be honest. Like, because like I said, they didn't say the style and like Ben's an amazing director. So like I love Catastrophe and I was like, well, it's going to look amazing. So... No, honestly, I just went in and was like, you know, this is how I would kind of film it. This is what I think is cool. And me and him just have very similar taste. And I think that I, I think he did that deliberately, though, because Ben's an executive on sex education as well. It's not like, you know, he was just there to kind of do the first half and then he left. So he was very involved in it with Laurie. Mm. So I think that was really key. And we just have really similar sensibilities. And yeah, I'm just so grateful because I know that all the team really backed me because mm. after that I met Laurie and Sean and again, like got on so well with Laurie and like I love the scripts and yeah, I think they all kind of, 
were like, I remember I had quite a few interviews for sex education and I'd sort of like walk around my house like, oh God, oh God, I hope I get the job. And yeah, and then I found out, I think Netflix were like, okay. But it was like a big leap. Like, I mean, yeah, it was massive. But Ben was like, you know, you can come shadow me on set, like when we're down in Wales, which I did. And kind of, I suppose like it was similar on Five by Five. I was like, oh, it's actually not like that different from a short, it's just obviously like they have a much bigger crew and they can afford the bigger crew, the food is much better. Um, <laughs> like, um, but yeah, but it didn't feel like as a director, I was like, I can't run this set properly. You know what I mean? So yeah, so I think honestly, it was just credit to them really for giving me a chance. And I think that's the amazing thing with Sex Ed though, I was actually talking about this yesterday, that I think it is one of the few shows in the UK because like all the directors that have gone on seasons after me they're all my friends that I've come up with and they're all doing amazing things now. Like Alice Seabright did season two and she just did her own show. So I do think like, was, I that, hope, was that Chloe? Yeah. Yeah, I, that's I, great. Yeah, and, like, and I think that the amazing thing about it is, I remember because Misfits, like my friend Will, he did that after graduating, but I think that had finished then and I think there weren't many shows, again, sort of like after five by five, like I just couldn't get my foot in the door. So. It's, a, it's so important and amazing, obviously, when there is a show like this that's willing to do that, because it is always a risk, but, you know, I think Marvel is the same. Like, you mm. see the directors Kevin Feige takes on, and, like, you know, they've done amazing feature films or, you know, like, different ways they've come in, but they haven't necessarily done something on the level of Marvel. So, yeah. although, but they were, again, one of the few studios, I think, that do that. Although I suppose you could say that the difference with sex education is that, you know, you could expect a backlash if it was all directed by old blokes. I mean, like, it's just not, it, it shouldn't be that kind of show, and it isn't. Um, mm -hmm. So you need that younger sensibility, and it's about teenagers, so, you know, you need people who are closer to that age, um, and it just, it, that, that kind of makes sense. Shall we remind ourselves a little bit of what um, uh, sex education was like? Should we have a look at a clip? Okay, let's do that. Okay. Um, so um, obviously that was like a, a massive, um, uh, you know, a, a attention getter. And I believe it was one of the first shows. So Netflix obviously have been very kind of circumspect about the numbers that, the pe of people that watch their shows because it's not good for them to, to advertise that. But um, they did do a top 10, um, not long after Netflix, uh, sorry, not long after Sex Education came out. And I think it was, at the time, it was their second or third like biggest show. It was like, it was very big. Do you know those, those stats? No, <laughs> I, uh, I don't know the exact stats, but I agree with you, like definitely, I think the thing that was so wild about it is that, you know, we were all so excited about the show, you know, like, I, I loved the scripts and I was just so happy we were working on it, but none of us could have predicted that it would become what it became. Mm. Um, I mean, it was great that it, it was embraced so much by people, but even like what you said, like, we weren't sure, because I think like it was early in Netflix's like, you know, original shows being made here. and. We didn't know, like, it, you know, we hope obviously people in, you know, the UK are going to enjoy it, but the reach beyond that, like, as well, we could not have predicted any of that. But that's the amazing thing about Netflix is it has this huge global reach. So, yeah, but I know that I, I don't know the exact stats, but yeah, definitely just even just seeing, you know, the reaction online to it. <laughs> I think it was something like 130 or 140 million people saw like the, the, the majority of the first series. And, and obviously those numbers are ridiculous compared to like, you know, um, uh, terrestrial broadcasters. Um, the thing I was going to ask you about a little bit was the cast, because obviously mm. um, you had not only Ace Butterfield and Gillian Anderson, but also Emma Mackey um, and Nakuti Gatwa. Um, would you mm. maybe talk a little bit about how you worked with the actors? Were there things that you found that they had picked up from already doing the first block? Because obviously mm. you're coming in for episodes five to eight. Were yeah. there things that um, they were already doing brilliantly? Like, did you yeah. adjust? Um, were, there, were there new things you came up with? Maybe you can mm. talk a little bit about how you work with them. Yeah, sure. So I think one thing I did as a director, like obviously with the handover from it, um, is that I, I asked for like, I think I had two days rehearsal with them all. And it was just me and the cast. And I think that was really important to me because obviously like you build trust on set, but you know, the amount, because we filmed it basically, again, like a film. So, like, I was filming episode five and episode eight sometimes on the same day. Like, I filmed the finale scene outside Otis's house, I think, on my second day with the mm. actors. Just because of, unfortunately, like, you know, logistics, that like, we had the house that day and that's the, when we had it. So, I knew I was like, okay, I have to build trust or at least the beginnings of a friendship with these actors very quickly. And so, basically, in that rehearsal... I just directed scenes with all of them. I kind of put them into pairs and then I kind of just 
went and had a chat with them all basically individually. Like, and then I, I got them all a DVD, which is hilarious because they're all very young. And they were like, oh, retro, cool, cool thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is quite funny. But that was honestly it. It was just about letting them all know that I had their back. And because some of them obviously hadn't been on a set before um, until obviously then they had filmed with Ben by this point. So yeah, they had been put through the paces to a certain amount. But then obviously I was so aware that in the half of the show that I directed, the drama does take a step up. And like Shooty, for example, the storyline he has in it is heavy. And it's a lot to ask of an actor to do a storyline like that. So for me, it was so important to make sure that me and him were on the same page with stuff. He knew he could vocalize things if he was like, you know, like, oh, actually, I think I'd play it this way or do it this way. And just that he was comfortable. And obviously that extends into the, obviously the intimate scenes as well. And we had an intimacy coordinator on the show, which essentially is like, I think the best thing to compare it to. So it's like, you know, like you have a stunt coordinator for stunts or a dance choreographer for a dance scene. So essentially they help plot out the scenes, but in a way that, you know, on the day there's like no improvisation with an intimate scene and that everyone is happy and committed to like what we're actually going to do. Because I think the worst thing is you don't want anyone, regardless of age, going home from filming a scene like that and not feeling happy of what they did in the day. So. That was like a massive learning thing for me as well. I think luckily now, most TV shows, it's standard. Like if you have an, inter I know in America anyway, like I think HBO, every scene that's intimate now has an intimacy coordinator. So I think that's amazing because it feels like it's almost changed the face of TV in that sense. Because I, I mean, obviously I wasn't part of hiring um, uh, Ita, who was Ita O'Brien, who was the intimacy coordinator, but it was one of the first shows I think worldwide that had hired someone to do mm. that. What was the, um, the the change like going into shooting? So you're basically creating four hours of TV, um, yeah. and, and before that, the most you'd done was 25 minutes in five <laughs> minutes, sort of bite-sized chunks. So what was that like? Well, maybe you can tell us some of the sort of the specifics. How long was the schedule? How long were your working yeah. hours? Like how how long did you spend on it in post? Like we maybe mm. maybe give us a bit of sense of that. Yeah. So I. Think I think we were on 11 hour shooting days, sometimes of overtime, but again, the first season, at least the season I did, we, we really made our budget work for us, but like you couldn't go into overtime because then you would lose money. And also I'm the second half of the show, so even just things like music tracks, for example, they'd used a lot of that money in the first half because you want to have those amazing tracks at the beginning. But then it was amazing for me and my editors because we and Matt Biffer, our music person, because we were like, well, let's just go really deep cut then and try and find really obscure music because we can afford it. But also, you know, that was kind of like a fun challenge anyway. Um, so no, I think in terms of schedule, yeah, I think it was roughly generally around 11 hours, but that includes an hour for lunch. So it's tight, you know, and I think Ben was really generous in giving me advice. Also, the amazing thing is because he was an exec and a director, he was like, you know, if you want to do something in a wanna, you could do a wanna. And I was like, oh, really? <laughs> so, like, that was amazing. But his advice to me, which was so helpful, he told me, he said, but highlight your script where you're doing wannas. Because sometimes, obviously, like, stylistically, you want to do one because, you know, it's right for the scene to feel like you're with the characters in that moment and you don't want to cut. And obviously, Ideally, you should be using, because you usually have two cameras, you should use your second camera for an alternate angle, or if you have enough time, have a few other angles on that, just in case the one doesn't work. Or when you're in post, actually, the studio are like, yeah, it's fine, but we don't like it, we want to cut or whatever, just so you're not screwed. But sometimes you don't have time to do that. <laughs> so, like, he was like, if you are going to do a one though, just highlight your script. So it's not like, you know, every single scene is a one Because, you know, sometimes, like, the corridor scenes, for example, it made sense to do those on steady cam and kind of do, you know, like a lead and a follow, which basically just means camera in front of the actors and then you shoot behind them so you've got a cutting point. And yeah, so that was amazing advice he had for me. But no, it was definitely like a marathon in terms and, of like and, and the how length. Many, how, many months, how, many, how many months was, were you actually oh, on set? God, I can't even remember now. I'm trying to remember because I think I got the job around Easter time and then I, I was in post right up until Christmas. So. God, I, can't I think remember. I remember you posting Maybe it was like eight months in total, something yeah, like that. Yeah, it was roughly around eight weeks. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I think so. For filming, sorry, just on set. Okay. Yeah. And then um, the other thing that Prano mentioned, which I thought was really interesting, on her mm. advice, I've since gone and bought the Godfather notebook. 
yeah. which has got like all of this breakdown, this huge document that Francis Ford Coppola made, yeah. all hand typed, um, uh, which basically is what I'm filming with this scene today, what I shouldn't forget, what are the pitfalls. It was uh -huh. really interesting. And I was like, oh shit, that's a fucking good idea. Um, do, do, you, do you take anything with you on set? Do you make yourself a kind of a script Bible? Like, what's the form of that? Yeah, it was actually just one thing I was going to say though, one of my favourite things from The Godfather, which I think is such good advice for any directors, so apparently he filmed like the wedding up front and they like freaked out at the studio and they were like, we thought this was about gangsters, like this is a wedding, like what is this? And like, but I think that's such good advice because, and then he obviously went off and filmed some scenes with, with a bit more violent and they were like, oh okay, it's what we paid for. But I would say as a director, just from personal experience, if you can when you're scheduling, put a scene up front in your schedule that the studio, what they obviously think they've bought into, because it just means that they're confident and relaxed. Because if there's a scene up front that's a bit, you know, like one of your weirder scenes or a bigger swing creatively, they might freak out. <laughs> so like, I think that's really helpful. Um, but yeah, I'm so sorry. So notebook, yes, yeah, so I have a thing. I mean, it's like really pretentious, but I call it like an emotion Bible, but I literally do have that. And I literally break down this scene and just for me, really, I kind of, because that's the thing, when often when you're filming, like I said, you could be filming the last scene of the show in the morning and a scene from like two episodes before in the afternoon. So I basically just every scene I had written out where the character was before, where they are now emotionally, where they're going to go. And obviously, like most actors are going to do this anyway, because it's acting. But um but I just, for me as a director, I wanted to know that, like completely in my head, like where we're supposed to, and how we want people to feel. Because then also, say like you get there on the day and you've kind of planned a shot in your head and it doesn't work. I'm always led by emotion, like how I'm gonna frame something or how I'm gonna shoot something, because it's obviously how you want the audience to feel. So I think that was always helpful for me, because I'd be like, okay, maybe I, maybe I could be handheld here, because it's meant to feel a bit more raw and we're meant to feel a bit more with the character. So, one of yeah. the things I, I can't remember, um, I should know who um, said this quote, but um, it was, um, it might have been Spike Jones, but he was talking about that the director's job in, in some ways is to control the flow of energy. Um, mm -hmm. And that obviously includes practically on and within the set, but also mm -hmm. with the performances, with, with, with the camera work, with everything. And so mm -hmm. that's maybe an interesting kind of catch all term which describes what the, the, the job is, which is kind of that sort of standing back and like sort of feeling yeah. like you maybe have a handle on the story hopefully everybody else mm -hmm. has got their specialism but you're kind of yeah and also because like everyone in their specialism they're going to pitch you stuff sometimes on the day <laughs> and they'll be like oh we couldn't get this but actually we've got this what do you think and you have to basically make that decision so quickly um so it's so key always being like okay that's better for story that's you know what i mean because essentially as a director you're really being hired for your taste and then i'd say like keeping calm under pressure and being able to make decisions quickly because I think that's I mean I do a lot of prep before I film I'm like very very into prep but I always go in with the knowledge that you know I can shot list something and as I've got more experience like after sex ed and some stuff on Loki me and my DP I wouldn't like if it was a walk and talk down a corridor I wouldn't do a shot list because I'd be like oh well I'll put that on Steadicam or because there's only so many ways you could film something like that or I'll just work it out on the day after we block with the actors but that comes from experience but I think the thing I've always done though is that I'm always ready to kind of throw my shot list away. <laughs> like, just because stuff changes on the day, you know, like you might block it with the actors and be like, oh, actually, this looks a bit strange. Um, and actually it's gonna be better if we block it this way. And I think another thing as well is time management. Because for example, you might have a scene that could be great and your actor's like, I'm gonna walk here, I'm gonna sit there. But I'm like, okay, that's a setup, that's a setup. <laughs> and like, and you only have so long to film in the day. So it's like, you can obviously give more time to one scene, but whatever you're filming in the afternoon, that's where you end up going into, okay, it's gonna to have to be a one because mm. we gave all the time to this other scene. Or you have to work with the actor to be like, I like, I, I, it's, like it's almost like we're as a writer, right? It's the note behind the note. So it's like, okay, well, we can't have you move around this much, but you don't wanna to say to an actor because of time, because they're like, oh, well, my creativity. <laughs> and like, you know, cause I, I wouldn't wanna hear that either. But I think it's more like, Okay, so obviously they want to give it energy, they want to maybe pace. So it's like, how do I work their idea into something that we can practically film and won't screw us for the day? <laughs> Find us at nodirectionhome.com. <laughs>